Thank you. So I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians on the land in which we're meeting today, and I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging, and to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people that might be with us today. I'd like to extend a warm welcome to Janelle Belden. Janelle is a passionate advocate for improving the efficiency of access to and the experience of clinical trials, as well as involving people in the design and conduct of research which aims to benefit their communities. This passion has evolved both through her professional experiences running clinical trials and from listening to the questions and stories that trial participants and their carers have generously shared with her over the years. Janelle is the Managing Director of Access CR, our social enterprise providing services to research sector in order to provide support, advocacy, advocacy for the needs of the community and consumer research workforce, i.e. the individuals and their carers taking part in and involved in research, especially clinical trials. So over to you, Janelle. Thank you. Thanks, Alison, and um, thank you to everybody for coming along and, and your interest in learning a little bit more about clinical trials. Uh, this presentation is really uh, I just want to check that I, you can see the slides, Alison. Excellent. It, it's a general presentation, so it's not directed at, at people that Pancare is supporting directly, but improving our awareness helps us um, know our choices around clinical trials. So please um, grab any questions that you have and we, we can cover them off at the end. Um, there is a little bit to get through um, and I hope it's of interest to you. So um, just as Pancare has acknowledged um, our cus traditional custodians of the unceded lands on which we meet, um, I'd like to pay my um, respects to the elders um, past and present who have cared for the land that I'm on today, which is the Wallamudical clans land in Sydney, and also welcome um, any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islanders joining the call today. So when we hear the word clinical trials, there are a couple of things that come to mind. For a lot of people, they're an avenue of hope. Um, they mean progress. They mean potential for longer, better lives, uh, better health, a future. <clears throat> but for equally, they also mean this to a lot of people. It means being a guinea pig. And what I'm hoping today is that by sharing a little bit about clinical trials with you, you will feel less of a guinea pig and more like an informed guinea pig um, who knows how to ask the right questions, who knows how to access clinical trials and to consider them as one of their healthcare options. Because when we know all our options, we have choices. So I'm going to cover what clinical trials are, um, why you might want to care about them, the basics around the who, what, where, when of clinical trials, a little bit on medicines development, just so that you know where clinical trials fit into the life cycle of new medicines, um, where to get some more information, and what happens, what can you be involved in beyond participating in research. So you're all probably familiar with what research is. You probably Google and, and search Siri and all, all those things all the time. It starts with a question and then you go seeking answers. And that's essentially what research is. But in, in, in the medical context, it's a process of discovery. It's about thinking through new concepts, understanding disease, figuring out ways to treat it, um, and all of those things. And it's done in a very systematic way. There's also lots of different types of research. So not um, all research are clinical trials. You have lab research. You have um, uh, clinical studies that are not actually trials. So clinical trials are just a subset of all the research that happens. This is what the official definition is of a clinical trial. It's any research study that prospectively assigns human participants or groups of humans to one or more health-related interventions to evaluate the effects on health outcomes. So in terms of interventions, most people think clinical trials are about new drugs, but actually they interventions 
has a much broader meaning. So it can be drugs and biological products. It could be surgical or radiology procedures. It could be new medical devices. It could be use of old drugs in new ways. It could be behavioural treatments, supportive care, diagnostic care, preventative health care, and even wellbeing, mental health support, diet and exercise. So clinical trials are done for lots of reasons. They're there to provide an evidence base for what clinicians say and do. So why would you care about them? Well, for patients and families um, and carers, in some instances, it gets you early access to potential new treatments. And I say potential because a clinical trial is done not knowing whether or not that thing that's being tested is going to be better than what's already available. So everyone, of course, is hopeful that a new intervention is going to be the best thing, but it isn't always the case. But for those people who do get access to those new things that work, um, that has positive life benefits. It gets you access to expert medical care. So the people that run clinical trials are usually the leaders in their field. They're the clinicians that are at the front of science. They are across all the literature and they're really pushing the boundaries to advance care for patients. And you get access to these experts um, through the clinical trial at no cost to you. For a lot of people that playing an active role in their healthcare provides personal benefits as well. So they learn more about their disease. They tend to pay a little bit more attention to their bodies and what's going on. And all of those things can often have a positive benefit to their healthcare because they're actively engaged in it um, and leading to positive outcomes, irrespective of what's happening in the trial itself. Lots of people do it to help themselves, but also to help others in the future, not have to go through what they're going through or to have better outcomes than they might think that they will have. For everyone, it means that we have better evidence about what's safe, what works, who it works for. It leads to better health healthcare outcomes because eventually you know what's working best and um, that provides better healthcare outcomes. And interestingly, institutions that run clinical trials um, tend to have better outcomes for their patients overall, irrespective of the clinical trials, because there's this greater culture around thinking forward, following processes, following guidelines, and, and that leads to better healthcare outcomes for everybody. There are also economic benefits through the, the commercial activity, the employment, um, the inputs into the health service that clinical um, trials provide. So there's lots of reasons why clinical trials are a, a good thing. They contribute in lots of different places. So they contribute to um, the, the frontline services, to the clinical practice, helping clinicians know what works and what doesn't. They also contribute to ideas for future research. They're used in um, regulatory applications um, so, so that a product can be marketed in our country. Um, it tells regulators what works, uh, how safe it is, what doses, when to use it, um, who it works for. And then it also helps our government decide which products it's going to fund. So um, how safe and effective something is, how it compares with what's already available, does it fill a gap for patients um, and based on eligibility criteria, who should get access to it? <clears throat> so they have a really important role in our healthcare system. They are a very complex, highly regulated environment. There are lots of interested parties. So we have government, we have funders, we have commercial and academic um, researchers, we have ethics committees, we have governance, there are, and lots of service providers, and of course, patients and their families. So there are a lot of people with a stake in successful clinical trials. There's also lots of regulation and paperwork. And if you're ever involved in a clinical trial, you'll see the, the team you're working with probably having to fill out lots of forms. 
And it's a really important part of the process. So there is a lot of administration, but it's really important to do that well and consistently and across different organisations that are running the same trial so that we can make sure that the data that comes out of clinical trials is reliable, that it's accurate, that it's, that it's credible. And that most importantly, that the people involved in the trials uh, are looked after. Their safety, their rights and their well-being are protected. Who runs trials? Well, in answering that question, there's kind of two levels to that question. So the first is the organisation that comes up with the idea and runs the trial. They're called a sponsor. So they run a study overall. They're the ones that uh, could be a commercial company or they could be an academic research group or a network. And they're the ones that are responsible for coming up with the protocol, which is really the Bible for what's being done in that study that everybody has to follow. Um, they're responsible for the quality, for deciding who gets what trial sites are involved, what um, making sure they are compliant with all the regulations. So they have a very important quality and scientific role and a medical care role in the study. However, the people that petition, participants will deal with are the trial site staff. So trial sites, so the hospital or the clinic that you go to, to to participate in the trial, they're usually run by a clinician or a researcher for that study. There can be one trial site or there can be many and they can be located um, all over the world. And it's really important that that protocol is very clear on what has to happen so that wherever that trial is happening, um, wherever the blood's being taken, the scans are being done, the drugs are being given, the, um, the patients are being cared for is done in the same way so that you can combine all the results from all those trial sites together um, and make sure that um, the trial outcome uh, is reliable. There's a few levels to approving trials. So as we said, they're highly regulated. In Australia, a human research ethics committee has to approve every study that involves people um, as participants. So they will be looking at the science of the study, the ethics, how participants, what participants are going to be told, how they're going to be cared for, the safety reporting is up to scratch, all of those things. So a human research ethics committee will approve the study. Then in some cases, uh, an, a trial site may have an extra governance approval step, which they're the people that look at the budgets and the, the resources and the contracts to make sure that they can actually run the study. In the case of where the intervention is a therapeutic product, so a medical device, a medicine, a biologic, something like that, um, that is under the regulation of the Therapeutics Good Administration, so our TTA, then the clinical trial will need to be, uh, they will need to be told that the clinical trial is also happening as well before it can get started. So there's lots of oversight. Um, externally on these to make sure that participants are safe and data are credible. Trials are funded by lots of different places. So the, the funding can come from governments, charities, health services, universities, um, companies, and even patient groups like Pancare sometimes fund research. Um, and the, and it's, the funders don't necessarily run the study. They give the money to the sponsors who then run the study. <clears throat> trial visits can happen all over the place. Sometimes they'll happen in hospitals and you, that might happen as an inpatient in stay or you might be a visitor to an outpatient clinic, but they can also be provided in, in lots of specialist clinics, uh, GPs, research institutes, pharmacies, universities, community centres even. And increasingly they're looking at what can be done at home or virtually so that um, it creates less burden for people to have to come into a clinic all the time. So there's a lot of work being done to see how we can reduce the burden to people participating in trials. A few other things to know. It is unethical to run a trial if clinicians and researchers really don't know which treatment or care is better. It wouldn't be right to put someone into a trial arm if they thought something else was going to be better. 
There is, however, as I mentioned before, no guarantee that the experimental treatment is going to provide a health benefit. It might even give a worse outcome. Ideally, it gives a better outcome, but there is no guarantee. And so you need to understand that when you sign up for a clinical trial. Participation is voluntary. You need to consent first, and we'll talk a little bit more about that process in a moment. And you can withdraw at any time. It's really important that you talk to the trial team um, if you want to withdraw, just to make sure it's safe for you to do that, because sometimes you can't just stop a medicine or you can't just rip a, an implant out. So you, they need to work with you to make sure that you come out safely. But it is your right to withdraw at any time from a study if you need to. There's lots of confusion around placebos. So I, I'm going to try and explain this, but uh, if you have any more questions, please feel free to ask at the end. There is a common misbelief that a placebo means there is no care. But what a placebo actually is, it's, it's really just a tool that's used by researchers to reduce bias and help them compare groups. It's, it's something that's a dummy or an inactive agent. So it looks like the thing that's being treated um, that sort of helps blind who gets what treatment. Usually you can't give no treatment as I mentioned, if something's known to work, that wouldn't be very ethical. So if there is a group that is placebo versus something else, you really need to inquire to understand what the placebo group is because typically it will be something on top of current standard of care. And it's worth no, but it is worth knowing that sometimes there is no proven standard of care that is known to work. And so in those cases, there may be no treatment. So if don't be just put off if a title of a trial has the word placebo in it. Really investigate what that means because it probably means the best current standard of care versus something else. And it's worth looking at that. So trials are not just about you've run out of options. Um, trials are done from prevention to diagnosis to treatment to supportive mm -hmm. care and even just understanding the best way to support people um, they're, and they're also not, as we mentioned, just about drugs and devices. Your doctor may or may not tell you about trials. They may not know about them. And they may not support your interest in trials. So many clinicians know as much about trials as the general public and have the same kinds of misunderstandings about them. Um, so it's always important to ask your doctor whether they know of any, whether they're happy to support you in trials or help you find them. But don't be surprised if they're just as clueless as you are. Um, and, and that's no disrespect to doctors. They have a lot to understand about what's already marketed that they can give you, let alone all the research that's also happening that might be supportive to you. You don't necessarily need a doctor to refer you into a trial. Um, sometimes their trials have something that is called eligibility criteria, which is kind of the group of people they're trying to enrol and they will often um, in in working out whether or not the trial is suitable for you um, and safe for you they may need some of your medical history and you may need to get that from your doctor but you don't necessarily need a doctor to refer you you can contact research teams directly and see if um, you might be suitable and then find out what the processes are for entering the trial Lots of trials are actually delayed because um, they can't find people to, enough people to take part. Uh, and there are multiple reasons for that. It can be, you know, the strict selection criteria. It can be because of where the trials are running as compared to where people live. It could be where, um, because people are unaware that they exist. So there's lots of reasons. And what that means is that research is slower than it needs to be. We saw, for example, during COVID, new treatments being approved really, really fast. And that was because they didn't have these delays in recruitment because everybody wanted a treatment. Everybody knew to look for a trial. Everybody was happy to put their hand up for a trial. So that's what's that's what can happen if trials, um, if everyone is aware of trials and happy to participate in them, is that you get much faster speed in, in new products. And you can just imagine in cancer what that would mean for people if you had that pace of change in new treatments becoming available. So when do trials happen? And 
I'm only going to talk about the trials for medicines because, and the reason for doing that is that you'll often hear these terms phase one, two, three, and four. They really only apply to medicines trials. Other types of trials won't talk about those phases. So just briefly to talk about medicines, there are lots of steps in getting a medicine from the lab to the, um, to the bench. Um, and so they start in the discovery phase. They then go into preclinical where they'll um, test lots of compounds in the lab and in animals and decide whether or not they think it might work in humans. Then it'll go into the clinical phase, um, which is where you'll get those phase one, two, and three trials. Uh, phase one is the first time um, something is put into a human, and usually in those trials they're just trying to see if it's safe for humans, not whether it works. Phase two is usually when they start to decide well, we know it's safe, let's figure out, well, let's, we kind of understand what it's going to do to the body, let's see if it actually solves the problem we think it will solve. And then phase three will be those big trials where they're comparing it with what's already available. So they'll progress through those different levels and then hopefully come out at the other end and be approved by the regulators. Um, and then they might do some more studies to get more information about safety or to prompt other ideas um, and other ways of using this product that bumps the product back into that life cycle. It takes a long time to get something from the start to the end um, and the clinical phase is the longest and they're, they're really trying to shrink that as much as they can um, at the moment by coming up with new trial designs, um, better awareness of people, um, trying to not have so many trials before they need approval so that those products are, are coming out and of benefit to patients more quickly. And even when it gets into the clinical phase, there are still a lot of products that fall out. And that can be for a multitude of reasons. It could be for safety, it could be because they don't work, it could be because they, the company can't figure out how to produce it in large enough quantities. Um, it could be because there's other competitors that are sh already showing better progress um, than what that that compound is doing. So there's lots of reasons to trial um, um, products fall out of that life cycle. Australia gets about 5% of the trials um, globally. So there is a lot to get. If you're able to travel, then that's a consideration. Um, and probably only about a third of them are actually sponsored by companies. So everyone thinks pharmaceutical companies run clinical trials, but there's actually a lot of trials that are not pharmaceutical companies. Um, they're run by academic groups um, and public funders. 40 to 50% are about drugs and devices and lots of other trials are then done in you know, supportive care, mental health, diagnostics, all sorts of different areas. In 2019, and I know um, hopefully next week some new figures will be published on this, there are about 1,800 trials started and about 95,000 people took part in those trials. And those trials are happening all over Australia. If you're in New South Wales and Victoria, you've got the best chance of getting the trials that are on in Australia, but they do happen everywhere. And just because you live in South Australia doesn't mean you can't participate in a trial in New South Wales. It's always about approaching the team and figuring out if there's any travel support for you to get there or, or whether or not there's other ways to do things. So... Don't let location necessarily be a barrier. Ask those questions around what travel support is available to get you there if you want to participate. Most of the trials are running on, the highest number of trials will be in oncology, followed closely by mental health, but they're happening in all sorts of areas. So um, there's lots going on. It's really important that lots of different people from lots of different backgrounds take part in trials so that we know that the who the trial results are relevant for um, and that they're more broadly relevant, that more of the population benefit from the research that's being done, and that we understand those differences in how a disease affects different populations and how those treatments work in different groups. If you're going to take part in a trial, these are kind of the steps, if you like. Um, First of all, you'll need to know that clinical trials are an option. And so participating in a session like this today, hopefully 
raises that awareness with you that clinical trials exist. You might then go looking for them or you might be approached by a clinician to take part in a trial and they'll hold a discussion with you about that trial, what's involved, who it's for, um, the kinds of people that they're looking for, what you'll need to do if you take part in the trial, how long it is. And importantly, they'll give you the details of the Human Research Ethics Committee that has approved it so that if you have questions um, about or issues with the trial, you've got a third party to contact. Then you'll consent or not to take part in the trial, and it doesn't matter which way you go. Um, it'll, it won't affect your ongoing care. Um, if you say no to a trial with, with, your, with that um, clinician, that's a really important thing to understand. If you do take part, though, you'll then go on to do whatever the trial requires. You'll take the medicine, you'll collect the data, you'll visit the clinic, you'll do the scans, the blood tests, whatever else is required, and eventually pop out at the other end, finishing the trial either because the trial has ended or because it's no longer safe or it's not working for you, um, all sorts of reasons. So you'll finish the trial, and you may decide to go on to another trial or um, or not. Finding trials can be a challenge. Um, we always advocate first that so you ask your doctor. Uh, if they can't help um, and many patients don't hear about trials from their doctors, but they hear about them through their social networks, different patient groups, through the news and media, um, and we're also available for a little bit of support if, in, in helping point you in the right direction if you need it. There are public trial registers. So every tr clinical trial is supposed to be listed on a public register. In a, these are the three that I recommend, the Australian one, the US one, and there's an international one. Um, and um, we can provide links to those if, if they're not available. Um, it is worth knowing, though, that those registers were initially set up and designed for researchers, not for the community. So they can be really hard to navigate. The information can be quite technical. Um, and it's not always easy to know how to get the results you want out of them. So um, knowing that um, will help reduce your frustration, but not necessarily because they can still be hard to, to navigate. There's also Google. Um, which, you know, is a pretty effective resource for a lot of people or or whatever your favourite search engine is. Um, and then there's these other things that are often called registers, but what they are are essentially lists held by different organisations of people that you put your name down on saying you're, you're interested in a trial in something and they will let you know when they hear of a trial. There is really no real place where you can find out about every trial from the one place. So if you're interested, I recommend you put your name down in lots of different places, but just look at um, understanding the privacy uh, around all those places that you might put your name down and, and what your expectations can be for hearing from those organisations. AustralianClinicalTrials.gov.au is the government's website um, and they... Um, have ways that you can be notified of trials that potentially come up in your area of interest. <clears throat> I also have a newsletter. I say they're fortnightly. It's um, we're kind of trialing a bit more like monthly this year. Um, and in that I do a search for everybody of the register of all the trials that have opened in the past month since the last newsletter. And I list all of those trials so that you can get a sense of what's out there without having to go to the register and look. And then there's links to go back into the register for more details if you're interested. There's lots of things you can ask um, about clinical trials. So when you are having that discussion with researchers, they will ask you lots of questions to see if you meet the selection criteria, the eligibility for the trial. Um, and if you don't, don't feel rejected by that, it's just um, a scientific process that they need to go through to make sure that they have a, a group that is comparable in the study. But you should also be asking questions about whether the trial is right for you. So, you know, how often will you need to go? 
Um, can you be reimbursed for your travel costs? Um, what will happen at the end of the trial? Um, how does this differ from my current treatment? Um, who's looked at the trial? Um, can I speak to anyone about it? How will it affect me? So there's lots of questions that you can ask. And this is a list that um, another consumer group that I'm involved with has put together as of key questions. But most places that are advertising trials will also provide you lists of questions. So do consider whether the trial is right for you, not just whether you're right for the trial from the researcher's perspective. And it is okay to ask questions. The process is designed that you have all the time you need to ask the questions mostly. You can also, um, participating in a trial is great um, if you can do that. Um, sometimes there's no trial available um, and that's just the nature of um, research that there isn't necessarily a trial for everybody. Um, there are other ways though that you can get involved and improve research. So increasingly, you know, the big picture level organisations and governments are looking for people with lived experience of certain conditions or the research process or the healthcare system to get involved with discussions around policy and process, um, perhaps in evaluating the research that is funded um, and in various governance and strategy kind of committees. And within research projects themselves, researchers are looking for people to help them come up with what needs to be researched. Um, prioritising the, the needs based on what the community needs to get involved in grant applications. And then throughout the whole life cycle of a research study, there are opportunities to get involved. So do look out for those. Even if you're not involved as a trial participant or have been, you can also get involved in research in different ways. As, I, as has been mentioned, we're here to try and support people uh, looking for taking part and involved in research and we have lots of research um, lots of more resources on the access CR website we have our newsletter we have a shop um, if you think what we're doing is great then I'd love you to consider purchasing something from that we also have a Facebook group it's a private group that anyone can join so long as they answer a couple of questions and that's a group that we talk a lot about you know, research opportunities and process and consumer involvement in that. And at any time, feel free to give me, um, drop me a line if you have other questions. So really, if you don't ask, you don't get. I encourage you to ask lots of questions um, in lots of different places to be informed. Um, and then as an informed person, you're less of a guinea pig. So I'm going to leave it there. Alison, and, and welcome any questions that you have. Thanks, Janelle. Does anyone have any questions for Janelle? Was it too much information? <laughs> Hi, it's Madeline here. Hi, Madeline. How are you? That was very good. Thank you very much. Um, I think uh, obviously I can listen back to that and perhaps answer my own question here. So a little bit of what you're saying is um, to do a lot of research ourselves, I guess, and and source where trials are happening. And one of the things you said was your, I think it's your group, I'm not sure, the CCREW group yeah. or yourself. Crew. Just crew. make it easy. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, the crew. Um, they, you got, you, basically what you have is you have a database of trials um, is that correct? So I don't have a database myself. I go to the public register, the ANZ Clinical Trial Registry, and I yep. do a search for all the trials that are open, and I provide a free listing of those trials just in the newsletter. I don't keep those records because the register is should be the source of truth um, and things will change over time. And those records are supposed to be updated by researchers all the time throughout the process when they start and close recruitment when they finish the trial. Okay. So, sorry, um, yeah. Yeah. sorry, my bad. <laughs> no, oh, good. So in me sort of this is my first sort of time doing all of this. So in me looking for um, trials that might suit my circumstances, et cetera, et cetera, around what you said, yes. am I best off starting with the ANZCTR 
or the Australian clinical trials, what, where would you say I go first? So if you're just looking to understand the process, the Australian clinical trials.gov website has some basic information about trials. It, it provides you a link to search the register. Interestingly, the way it searches the register as compared to how you can search on the register itself can give you different results. Okay. So I would encourage you to use both and see what you get. Um, also think really broadly about if you go to the ANZ um, clinical trial register, and maybe I can show that really briefly if I put it on my screen. Um, so I'm going to just try and pop that on my screen. Let me know if that appears on the screen. Yes. Is that there? Great. Mm -hmm. So this is the register. You'll go into this bit here to search for a trial. I would encourage, you can start with this search box. So let's just say pancreatic cancer. And you'll see there are 281 records. I would suggest going to this advanced search option and then perhaps deciding the type of trial that you're looking for. You probably want the studies that are open that are looking for people. So you tick those boxes. Um, and um, you probably also then just, maybe you only want to look in Australia because as a public register, they can accept trials from anywhere in the world. So you will find trials that are not in Australia on our register. Yeah. Um, you might decide that you can only do it, you know, within, um, you can only travel 50 Ks within where you live. And then you could perhaps search. Oops, hang on. Let me just put pancreatic cancer in. And you'll see that there's few, much fewer trials for you to search through. So there's only five there. Um, you can then click on any of these, look at the full record, and I'll just, as an example, so that you know the kind of information that you will get on there. You'll see when it was registered, when it was last updated, kind of what it's about. There is supposed to be some language for the community that is aimed at the community on here, but some researchers are better than others in describing their research in, in, in plain language. They'll talk about what study is about, what the outcomes are, and importantly, they'll have these eligibility criteria. So you'll be able to get a bit of a sense of, depending how well you know your condition and, and you know some of the clinical features around it, you might be able to see whether or not you're likely to be suitable for this study before you approach the team. So it'll, it'll give you the key criteria. It won't, be, it won't necessarily be everything. The, the research team will then probably need to do some more screening, which is, you know, learning a little bit more about you to see whether or not you meet the eligibility criteria. Um, it'll tell you what phase it is, whether there's randomization. We haven't talked about randomization in this presentation, but Randomization is another one of those tools researchers use to reduce bias in the studies because if they decide person A goes on treatment A and person B goes on treatment B, they may be self-selecting who's going to do better. So they use randomization as a technique to prevent that from happening. Um, oops. And then they'll tell you all the places it's happening. Right. So uh, you'll be able to see that. And usually there'll be a contact details towards the bottom of how you can contact the research team. So um, that would be the process. If you see something that you want to do, that's that's a good place to start. And you're currently on the ANZ one, aren't you? I am, yeah. yes. Yeah. So, so that's ctr.org.au. Yeah, so that sort of that does appear to be the, the better one for so there's so many resources. <laughs> it's very confusing. I've got lists of 
of things. So when you put in that top bar, <clears throat> pan- excuse me, pancreatic cancer, yes. you can refine your what you're searching for. Say, um, yes, you know, for example, new medications that are closer to the stage four phase or anything like this. Does that sort of thing come up? So I'm not sure. Let me have a look if you can search by phase. I'm not sure that you can treat them properly. Trials that are in your phase four or or late phase three, they should tell you where they're at as well. So time is of the essence. You can search on phase. There you go. Ah, great. So um, just to let you know, Australia typically attracts more of the early phase studies. Because we are, compared to countries like China and India, we have a lot less people. And so it's harder for us to recruit big numbers into studies compared to some of those other countries that we compete against. Um, And so often we will do a lot of these studies because we have very good scientists and and clinicians and you need less people for phase one and phase two studies. So phase one studies might have between... 10 and 50 people in total in those studies. Phase two studies might be sort of 20 to 250 people might go in phase two studies globally. And phase three studies will be somewhere kind of between that 500 to 20,000 mark, depending on the nature of the study. Um, So, you know, if you think about that's the number of people globally who've been tested with that intervention, it's actually not heaps and heaps of people in the grand scheme um, of things, which is why marketed drugs still collect more safety information. Um, and so with the that site, the ANZ CTR, that yes. does, if, as long as you put in the country, so to speak, it will broaden that search to New Zealand or uh, US or yes. whatever. Yeah. So it's, it is a global site really, isn't it? It is, but the, it's primarily, you. it will be primarily um, Australia and New Zealand. And I'll show you just one other thing. When you get these search listings, you'll see typically blue ones and green ones. Yeah. And the difference between those is that a blue one has been put directly on the ANZ register. The green ones are data that they have pulled from the US register that says they have an Australian site. So they haven't put the data directly into the Australian register, but particularly commercial studies, there is a requirement in the US that if you are running a study in the US, you it's mandated that you put it on their US register. So they you only have to put it on one register in the world. Um, and so... Um, If it's running in the US, it will typically be on clinicaltrials.gov, which is the US website. And, um, you know, that's that's a whole, that will look quite different to the ANZ clinical trial register and you can get a lot more information from that. But, yeah, that's the difference. When you see a blue study and a green study, it's because the blue ones have been put in by directly to the ANZ register and the green ones are pulled in from the US. Okay. So to, to to do my research, I'm keen to, obviously, from what you said, I'd go through the ANZ CTR, the Australian Clinical Trials, and I can put my name down here in either of these spaces? So um, I know the uh, Australian Clinical Trials uh, website has recently been changed, but there you go. If you come to that website, you again to do a search, and what this will search is the ANZ CTR, but they they have different ways of searching, so sometimes the results can be a little bit different. Okay, and got you. They try and make this the more consumer-friendly way to search. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, but, yeah. You can also find out a lot more information about trials there as well. And this is an ongoing process in trying to improve this so that people can find trials more easily. Thank you. No worries. Does anyone else have any questions for Janelle while she's online? 
But that was great, Madeline. Some practical questions are, you know, probably what most people are wanting to know. So that was great. Brett? Uh, yes. I can hear a voice. Uh, it's, um, uh, it's Jeff. Yeah, Jeff. Jeff. Yes, yes. Hi, how are you? Good. Um, I don't. I don't actually have any questions. Well, other than one question, which is, I've very recently been invited to join a trial that is a a, a genomic uh, trial. I think it's the short title is CAS C A S P Cancer Screening Program um, yeah. by uh, the program sponsor is Omico. Yes. Um, now, this is all very new to me because it's just happened in the last week and I haven't really done any uh, research or reading up on it, but, you know, I'm about to, uh, when I say potentially, I think it's highly unlikely I wouldn't do this, I'm about to sign up for this trial. So I don't have any questions because it's all very new to me, but am I able to contact you if... When I start looking into this, uh, you know, I do have some questions. Mm. So the research team are going to be great for those specific questions about the trial, but any time you have, you know, general questions like what should I be asking or, you know, I don't really understand this information, I'm, I'm happy to try and help you navigate yep. that. Um, yep. I about the CAST trial. Um, I think it's uh, it's a really fantastic initiative as we go towards um, more personalised medicine in cancer, um, understanding yep. your genomic profile so that you can get the right targeted treatments is really, I think, fundamental, particularly in the cancer space. Um, just be clear on what the implications are for you around understanding your genomic profile to your healthcare, your insurance, all of those things. So just just make sure you do kind of research for anyone doing genomic well, or genomic testing. I'm really pleased to hear that positive feedback. That's great. So how would I contact you, Janelle, if I do have questions? I came into this Zoom meeting just a wee bit late, so I might have missed a couple of things. Yeah. Um, um, Alison, did you want to share my contact details? Yes. Up to I me? will share with you, Jeff, following the talk. Um, I've also put some information in the chat, which is available now, um, which is yep. the socials, the address, but I can share all this on email following this group discussion. Yep. Um, Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Can I jump in and just tell that gentleman that's talking now? that I have agreed to become a participant, I believe, in the same trial that you're referring to. Um, oh. And I can tell you that if you ring the 1800 phone number in the paperwork that you receive for that, the ladies that yep. answer the phone, are the, the they sound like a bunch of young ladies. They are the most informative, easy to talk to. Um, I can't give them enough credit how they have helped me with just the craziest little questions, you know, that and, and so please, I think that it would, if you have questions about that trial, don't hesitate to ring that number because whomever's running it is doing a damn good job of communicating, certainly with me anyway. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. knowing that team, they are, they are on top of their game in this space. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, fantastic. Oh, it's a very positive uh, feedback. That's great. Thank you. I always just advocate people ask the questions that matter to them, though. So while I'm an advocate for clinical trials, I'm an advocate for choice. So know your options and then make a choice. Yep, yep, yep. no worries. Any other questions from anyone? No. Okay, well, thank you, Janelle. That was really informative. And if anyone thinks of anything else that they'd like to ask, 
you can email us um, with any inquiries, but I will also share Janelle's details with the group uh, following um, this catch up. So thank you very much, Janelle. Well, I'll pop off now and enjoy the rest thank of the session. You. Thank you, Janelle. Thank Bye. you. Bye.